<laughs> the truth of the matter is I am conscious of who I'm writing for and what I'm trying to do. Before, I used to write blues in the style of people that I used to dig, such as Bobby Bland or James Brown. I, I even got into country music and loved that for a while. I'd, and I'd write songs in the style of Merle Haggard or people like that, you know. But now I'm thinking of not so much of any person, because as I said, that my influences don't come from music so much as from literature, films, media, and things like that. Because there isn't anyone in my field or anyone that far out that could influence me. There's no one that I could take that from. So basically, when I sit down, I do consider what I'm trying to do. And that was something I never did before. It used, it used to flow naturally. And while I'm still, you know, I'm still invoking the muse. <laughs> But, uh, but I am conscious of what I'm trying to do. I should say this is KTIM and KTIM FM in San Rafael, and I've got a cut over here called The Spot. And uh, would you introduce this? This is a single that does not appear on your album. Absolutely. This was, the, this was my first attempt at going out there and trying something completely new and completely different. It was a minor hit in England last year, and it basically was the thing that inspired me to keep on trying and to, and to keep taking it further out. Before I play it, I always ask this question of people who, who come to the station from Australia or wherever, where, where the record business and the radio business is different, because it's, you know, it's, it's enthralling to me to hear the differences. When you have a minor hit in England, does that mean that it sold in the stores, that it got played on the radio, or how does, um, how does the public... How, what's the difference, I should say, between records being sold in England and being sold here? Because I know the radio is so different. Well, first of all, I mean, you obviously know about the BBC being in absolute control of all the radios, apart, apart from the local uh, stations that they have. But, I mean, it means getting coverage in the music papers, which are incredibly powerful in England and much more present than they are over here. Mm -hmm. There's about four major papers that everyone gets every week, and they basically cover it and, you know, give it publicity and rate it as being something worth listening or not to and uh you know there are the charts over there just as they are over here and this slipped into the bottom last year it's well ahead of its time as far as i'm concerned okay. um oh i know what i was going to ask you just recently you played uh perhaps your first gig in the city if it's if it's Absolutely. not it feels it like it to me yeah okay and you got well as you were saying quite a bit of mileage out of one night and uh perhaps you can tell us about the preparations and uh, what it's like to play live Absolutely. Well, it was, it was very strange, basically. <laughs> very strange. It was a strange evening and a strange few weeks of preparation. I was just asked to do it, and, and the people that asked me pretty much expected that I'd say no, and I pretty much expected that I'd say no as well. But some demon inside of me made me say yes. <laughs> so I went ahead and did it. I figured the major problem was that a different and completely new kind of music's got to be presented in a new kind of way. So I didn't want to go on with a group and just do my thing as uh, so many others do right now. So basically I got the, the idea of the Vestal Virgins <laughs> after a great deal of discussion, discussion with various people amongst whom the residents and uh, the cryptic corporation and various people. Incidentally, one of the one of the Vestal Virgins is pregnant now, so oh. I really don't know what we're going to do for the next gig. <laughs> it's going to be hard to find another virgin on really? short notice. <laughs> At long notice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I mean, generally, I just did a one-off thing, and I'm going to be doing another gig on December the third with a few of my uh, cryptic stable mates, as it were. And uh, I'll probably be doing the, the Vestal Virgins thing again with the various help from various other people. But it's not the thing that I'll be going on the road with next year. So uh, it'll probably be the last opportunity to catch that gig as it is. It's also on Video West next Wednesday. Oh, really? Next Wednesday? This, this coming Wednesday, excuse oh, me, yeah. Tomorrow? Yeah, it was on on Saturday too. And oh, I didn't hear uh, about that. I'd like to check that one out. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a, basically we did a couple of songs down there at Video West and uh, we thought that perhaps that kind of performance ought to go on film as it wasn't going to be a, an average thing going around the country and going around the world on tour or anything. I didn't see the last performance but I heard that the residents took part. Uh, did they play or sing? Well, one resident came up on stage and, uh, and sang one of my songs. Uh, 
they were obviously, you know, they produced and recorded with me, so uh, they know, they're know they pretty familiar with all the songs. They wrote, co-wrote them with me. And might we expect them on the December 3rd performance? Well, I'd say not. They, they probably only do one thing a year. I mean, you can't expect their world tour next year. The oh, really? Next year, the Residence World Tour, which will include me. And uh, regardless of what state of mind I'm in at the time, <laughs> I'll be with them on tour. And uh, they're basically thinking of getting started doing it. Uh, so they're coming out of uh, wherever they've been. Do they have other professions? I've heard um, rumors that they were actually all doctors and that they got together when they were in their residency. Oh, I heard that they were interior decorators oh, myself. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and that they had a wonderful mansion with chair legs carved to their own particular <laughs> preference. <laughs> I like that one much better. Uh, I went to the the, uh, the trouble of looking up cryptic, and uh, I liked what I found. I thought I understood what it meant, but it means hidden, secret, occult, or enigmatic. Absolutely. Is that the uh, future of uh, Ralph Records? Are they ever going to be commercial or 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 be in business to make money? A lot of small labels have difficulty in, in actually selling their records, even when they when they have hits like 415 Records in the City. You know, they have a, they have a few successful artists, yeah. but it's. By, you know, the record business is a difficult one to get started in, and I just wondered, uh, is, is Ralph um, got its audience? Uh, is it is it safely in, uh, well, in in the music business? <laughs> the, well, yes and no. You know, I mean, they've changed they've changed music for whatever for whatever that makes. They've done it. It's down to the audience. It's down to the world whether they'll ever be successful or not, because they're not making any they're not making any compromises. <laughs> Uh, so it's absolutely down to the audience. And yet the pressings do. are always very well done. The artwork and the coloring is usually excellent, and so the packaging is not uh, is not shoddy. And there must be. Um oh, absolutely not. In fact, they were they were nominated for a Grammy for the cover for Eskimo, which uh, which I, I consider one of the most excellent covers in the past you know decade at least. Um, and I think I read somewhere where they got an excellent review for the anthology, the Subterranean. Uh, Whatever it is, subterranean. Subterranean modern. Yeah, yeah subterranean absolutely. modern. I saw that somewhere. Yeah, it's basically the San Francisco sound, you right. know, and, and there is a San Francisco sound now. There is, a, San Francisco led the world once before, and I think it's doing it again now. You know, it has some of the most modern, interesting bands around at the time. You know, right now. So we're going to look forward to seeing you December third. Also on the uh, never before announced before in the station, the Residence World Tour. Do you know where they're going? They should. They should. Pretty much generally all over the world. Yeah, you know. should, the residents at Budokan. I can't wait for that. I don't know if they'll be playing Scotland, but if they do, I'll be. When, I'll be one of the biggest fans. <laughs> Speaking of that, Horse Lips from Ireland is on the way over here. We might. You actually might cross in the halls. Are you familiar yes. with that band? Quite possible. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I knew them when they were uh, an Irish folk band. Yeah. They're now, now they're an Irish rock band. They made a successful transition in absolutely, that respect. Absolutely. Absolutely. They'll be over here later this afternoon. Um, let's hear another cut from your album. I think we had uh, Here Comes the Bums queued up. And do uh, you remember the day you wrote this one? Sheer paranoia. Sheer paranoia all the way. <laughs> Locked in your room? <laughs> Nothing else to commend it whatsoever. <laughs> all right, Snake Finger, Here Come the Bums. Reminds me a little bit of when I lived in New York. and the, You had to be very careful when someone asked you for a dime not to stop. You know, if they stopped you in the street, they had you. It reminded me of that for some reason. Record happened to be leaning up against the wall here, and you, uh, you're a friend of Peter's or an acquaintance? Yeah, I'm an acquaintance of Peter's mm -hmm. from way back, good old Croydon days. And he's, um, well, I don't want to malign the man because he's got a <laughs> successful record out. Would you say he's a little, a little difficult to get along with, or perhaps he's just? Well, he's not difficult to get along with. <laughs> I mean, he'll do anything you ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Poor old Peter. No, he doesn't really know what day it is. But I mean, you know. What can you say about the old chap? Did he, uh, did he, is he a drug casualty or did he just lose his mind somewhere along the road? Well, I think he had a small portion of brain found lodged in his skull back oh. in the uh, late 60s. I think he had to have it removed. Oh my. <laughs> Snakefinger's our guest here at KTM and we're just about to get ready to play his, uh, his new single, which is called Kill the Great Raven. Kill the Great Raven is absolutely the name. And uh, how's the single doing? Pretty good, so I so they tell me. But I mean, you can't believe anything you read nowadays, <laughs> can you? Well, you know, one thing that's happened in, in the in the British record buying um, I don't know how to put this in England. Here we go. In England, a lot more people are buying singles and EPs of a group because 
they simply can't afford, you know, to buy a lot of albums. The, the price of an album is so prohibitive over there. They're incredibly uh, expensive in England like albums. The equivalent of like 12 or 14 bucks for just a regular single right. record set. Yeah, yeah. Simple album costs you about 14 bucks in England. So to get around the cost of, the, you know, the unit cost, uh, a lot of people are, are buying the singles, you know, or buying the EPs with four cuts on them. And that's not being, a, a, you know, embraced here as it is in England, but at the same time, a lot of small record companies are finding that's a great way to get their records on the market and to release singles and, and you know, put a, lot, put a lot of push and local publicity on the on the artist. And is that uh, one of Ralph's methods to ensure there's record sales? Well, Ralph always puts out a single. They, they like doing that. They used to put out an, they put out an EP or two, but um, the cost of doing that in America is really expensive, I mean. For the same price you can put out an EP, you can put out an album, so the residents figure, you know, value for money. Sure. Whereas in England, it's a different matter altogether, you know, people put out EPs because they're a lot cheaper than albums, and people would rather spend a little money on an EP than a huge amount of money on an album. Now that we've seen the issue of your first solo album, Chewing Hides the Sound, uh, what can we look forward to, uh, you know, for the future? Do you have concrete plans for what's going to happen next? Absolutely. There's going to be a tour next year. I'm basically working on that at the moment. It won't be anything like the live gigs that I'm doing nowadays. Will you take a band then? Uh, well, I'll take part of a band. <laughs> Definitely not a whole band. I don't want a whole bunch of musicians bothering me all the time. <laughs> we all know what bozos they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what sort of instrumentation will you be using in terms of amps and special effects? And um, I know a lot of the, you know, the musicians that are listening would like to know what, you know what you play and what you take with you when you perform. Well, I play all the guitars. I play, I play slide and uh, regular guitars, basically never sounding like ordinary guitars, hopefully, never sounding... I also have a guitar orchestra. What's that? Which is, basically, if you play, if you play a chord, you're playing one note after another note. Every time you play a chord, you're playing one string individually over a period of time. What the guitar orchestra is, plays that chord but it plays it all at the same time, which is a sound that no one's ever heard before. It's, it's generally overdubbed, but unless you, unless you can get about five or six people to form a guitar orchestra, it's the only way it can be done. So basically, this is a completely new sound. It's a guitar orchestra, and it's basically all the people do is play one note each, but they play it simultaneously, as, as in a piano chord, only it's a guitar orchestra, and this is what forms a lot of the backing to uh, what I'm playing on my new album. So the guitar orchestra will be featured on the tour next year. So when you're playing the guitar and trying to guise the sound so it doesn't sound like an ordinary guitar, do you use a um, certain amount of electronic devices or is it absolutely, technique? Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Any, any electronic device <laughs> available, <laughs> I will use. I don't have any scruples as far as that goes. I'm not pretending to be uh, the greatest live, natural, a biodegradable guitarist <laughs> in the world, you know. I'll use anything that makes it interesting, and I'll use any technique that will add interest and add mileage to what I'm doing, basically. And different tunings and things like that. Different like. tunings and different instruments. We even make up our own instruments if we want a particular sound that isn't available. We'll make the instrument that makes the sound that we want. How come Eskimo took such a long time to record? How long did that take? Eh? Three years. Wow. The instruments and the technology needed to record it just weren't available. We had to make up our own instruments and do a whole lot of stuff like that just to be able to play what we visualized mentally. So the recording process with the residents and on your own is a, is a lengthy one. It can be. With it a lot can of be. research and development going into... Abs development being the operative word, absolutely. That's the way we do it. It's been fascinating having you come by. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, you got to come by again sometime. Maybe you can bring some of your stuff and we'll fill up the room with amps, and you can play for a while. Well, let me say, I just can't believe how loose and pleasant it's been, so uh, I've really had a good time. Oh. Well, so have I. I'm sure our listeners agree. If they don't, they haven't been listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. Well, right on. So it's, here's, to you, it's nice to have you here. Snake Fingers, our guest, and we'll hear his single. It's called Kill the Great Raven. Was there anything you'd like to say in, in regards to this tune? Basically that I just use the old reggae beat that's been with me ever since I was about three years old, hearing it bashing out of the bricks and basements where I lived. And I just used that basis and took it into the future.
Thanks for coming by. Yeah. Snake finger on KTIM.